In the skies above the semi-arid lands that will one day be England, there are many types of pterosaurs gliding on the wind. Many, like the Ornithocarids, patrol the coasts, feeding on the plentiful fish the shallow seas provide, while others patrol inland, looking for completely different food. A Seodactylus soar through the air on five meter wide wings, scanning the lands below not looking for live prey, but for carrion. They fill a role similar to modern vultures, and when a large dinosaur dies, it doesn't take long for one or a dozen of these large flying reptiles to descend to the ground for an easy meal. One male Iseodactylus has spotted a potentially large meal, however he is forced to wait, as the carcass hasn't been abandoned yet. A Neovenator has taken down an Iguanodon, and is in no rush to feed quickly. Above the kill, the male Iseodactylus has been circling, waiting for the theropod to finish its meal. In that time, three more of his kind have joined him, and the four pterosaurs casually glide through the air, patiently waiting to feed. Eventually, the large carnivore below them has had his fill, and walks away to find some shade to rest under. No sooner has the predator walked away from the iguanodon's corpse, scavengers are already scurrying for the carcass. A swarm of Comsognathids move to the body as fast as they can, eager to get at the exposed flesh. And from the sky, small pterodactyloids called Euctanodactylus land on the top of the Iguanodon, going for the softer parts of the body. Further away, the Iseodactylus gracefully descend to the surface and land on their hands and feet, their large wings folding neatly behind their arms to protect their vulnerable membranes. Each one of them marches up to the now swarmed carcass, with the first male up front. Seeing the broad-beaked flyers approach, the smaller scavengers clear the way, with many having only gotten a bite or two. Finally getting to the body, the male Asiodactylus opened his jaws and bit down into the untouched side of the Iguanodon. His long teeth punctured clean through the tough hide, almost going into their standard interlock position. He then used his strong neck and pulled backwards, cleanly tearing away a small yet easily swallowable morsel. Aseodactylus' beaks are not meant to catch slippery or struggling prey. Instead, they are adept at ripping large carcasses apart with some of the most powerful jaws and necks for pterosaurs their size. They are crucial to breaking down large carcasses and stripping meat from bone. Though they are quite specialized, they have grown very large, similar to condors. The other three Aseodactylus move to different parts of the body and begin to dig in. Whether it's flesh, muscle, tendon, or organs, they will eat just about anything, but they cannot break apart bones. Though, if they have to, they can rake their teeth along the exposed bones to get at any remaining bits of flesh. Another male struggles with a particularly stubborn piece of flesh. He braces his arm against the Iguanodon's leg and digs his claws in. After a long pull, he finally rips a prize clean, but the amount he pulled was a little more than he expected. The first male sees this, and grabs some of the dangling meat in his own jaws. The two then pull in opposite directions, breaking the meat apart into smaller pieces. This might seem like stealing, but the first male was actually helping his fellow pterosaur, ripping the meat into a size that both would swallow more easily. Each one of these powerful flies keeps an eye out for danger. Despite their size, there are many predators that would be able to chase off the Aseodactylus and any of the other scavengers at this banquet. The small scavengers themselves keep their distance. But brave ones do try and eat from the head or tail where the Aseodactylus have ignored so far. Despite their fondness for carrion, the Aseodactylus could easily snap up a small Compsognathid if they felt so inclined. No matter how much they devour, these large pterosaurs will only consume a portion of the meat of this corpse, and will open it up, allowing the smaller scavengers easier access to the softer insides. Once they are finished, each Aseodactylus will go their separate ways, to find roosts and rests after a full meal. They may not have to eat again for weeks. Hello fellow travelers and welcome back. Today we will be breaking down a specialized scavenger, Isalodactylus. 
Isaiodactylus' first remains were discovered in 1887 from the Wessex Formation in the Isle of Wight. Since then, it has gone through quite a bit of change, including being first identified as a bird and one of its fossils going missing in a museum for over a century. Isaiodactylus was a large pterosaur with a wingspan up to 5 meters, though some fragmentary remains assigned to the genus indicate a wingspan of 8 meters. It stood between 1.2 and 1.5 meters tall, and weighed between 20 and 40 kilograms. At first glance, a Sayodactylus may seem like a standard pterosaur, and much of its body is. It is a typical build, with a small, compact body, short hind legs which are 4.5 times shorter than its forelimbs. The forelimbs were long, with the fourth extended finger, also known as the wing finger, being as long as the rest of the arm with the wing membrane spread out between the finger, arm, waist, and down the leg. It's Isaiodactylus' head and its unique features that separate it from other pterosaurs. The jaws take up 80% of the skull, which sounds like a lot, but for pterosaurs that's actually lower than average. The skull was also quite broad, with the tip of the beak being rounded, blunt, and heavily reinforced with bone. The middle of the snout is mostly made up of large openings or fenestra, that helped reduce weight. The back of the skull was quite tall and had a small crest or ridge at the front. Acelodactylus had 24 teeth in the upper jaw and 24 teeth in the lower jaw, all located at the tip of the snout. They were evenly sized, triangular, and compressed sideways, with roots shorter than the crowns. The teeth were evenly spaced so that when the jaws were closed they would interlock creating the famous zigzag pattern. Over the last century, scientists have come up with a lot of theories as to what Acelodactylus was eating with its odd head. Originally, it was thought to simply feed on fish like its relatives, and then it was thought to behave more like a wading bird, like a heron. It was even proposed it filter-fed like how some ducks feed, with its wide mouth. Modern scientists, including Mark Witten, re-examined Acelodactylus' features and came up with a new theory. You see, Isaiodactylus' remains aren't found in coastal areas, but more inland, and it's not really built for catching fast, slippery fish. And though the front of the skull is reinforced and has strong neck muscles, a lot of the skull is quite thin and so not built for catching and holding onto struggling prey. All this information led scientists to conclude that Isaiodactylus was a specialized scavenger of large vertebrates. Acelodactylus likely soared high in the air over its semi-arid home looking for deceased dinosaurs and would descend if the coast was clear. Once at the carcass, it would use the tip of its rounded jaws to bite into a piece of flesh and then using its strong neck muscles, pull off a small chunk of meat and then swallow it whole. This eating strategy has been described like using a cookie cutter, with both taking small pieces of food at a time. This might sound too specialized, but a few vulture species have similar skull anatomy, with some parts of the skull being strong and other parts being comparatively weak. Their skull and body sizes mean that they aren't suited to tackle struggling prey, but are good at ripping into carcasses. Acelodactylus also had rather small eyes compared to its more predatory relatives, as it didn't need them to find hiding prey or make precise well-timed strikes. This is another feature they share with vultures, that have smaller eyes than birds of prey. Another strategy they may have used was scraping their teeth or beaks along bones in order to get every last morsel of flesh from a carcass, similar to marabou storks. Being a specialized scavenger, Isaiodactylus likely spent a large amount of time on the wing, and this is supported by its fossils. Isaiodactylus' chest had a large area for downstroke musculature attachments, and well-developed pectoral and upper arm bones, suited for it to glide on the wind for long periods and rarely having to flap its wings. However, its wings are notably shorter than other ornithocaroids, and this may be because its relatives are better suited for flying over vast stretches of oceans, while Isaiodactylus lived inland and didn't need such wide wings. This would also make it easier for Isaiodactylus to take off from the ground which, given that it likely had to take off to avoid large land-based predators that wanted to scavenge the same food, is probably why it didn't develop such large wings. Many people look down on scavengers as being dirty or lazy carnivores, but they provide a crucial ecological service, 
They often get rid of meat that other carnivals don't want, and prevent it from rotting and spreading disease. And without large scavengers like vultures, condors, hyenas, etc., vermin like rats and cockroaches would be much more prevalent, and spread their own diseases. A sailodactyl has clearly evolved to take advantage of a resource that was in regular supply, and likely played a key role as a carcass cleaner. Though I've compared it to vultures a lot, I feel in terms of size they are close to condors, and I imagine they wouldn't mob a carcass like you often see vultures doing. Instead, you'd occasionally see a few gliding high in the air on vast open wings, and when they landed, they would scare off any smaller scavengers, and then efficiently strip a body down, even scraping the bones of the smallest morsels of meat. But despite all of these interesting features, I'm willing to bet that almost no one knows about Acelodactylus, but I do hope that you all enjoyed learning about it as much as I enjoyed researching it. With all that said, what do you think of Acelodactylus? And for my question of the week, do you think that regular pterosaurs with their long, toothless beaks also scavenged on large dinosaur carcasses, or stuck to their lane, so to speak? What lesser known extinct creature would you like me to do a breakdown on next? And until then, please like, share, subscribe, and thank you for watching.